Our subject this evening is baptized into Christ, and we will only focus on one verse, verse 27 of chapter 3. We are reading from the English Standard Version. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For as many of you as were baptized Baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, here we are in your presence. Some localized at this venue and others scattered in various places but we have taken the time out this evening to meet, to meet with each other, but perhaps more importantly, to meet with you so that we can look together at the word of life. Lord, is there anything that is of greater importance in our weekly uh, responsibilities than this? Is there anything more precious? Is there anything that has, the, that has a greater potential to transform our lives? It is doubtful that there is anything. And we just want to bring our best to this evening. The one who teaches and those who hears, let us unite our hearts together in a great attempt to honor the God who has wrought in us such a wonderful salvation and is leading us on to a greater understanding of his word. We commit ourselves into your hands today in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. We will begin this evening by reading the comments of Warren Wearsby relative to the section of Paul's letter to the Galatians that we have been dealing with recently. Warren Wearsby, he has passed away now, but he served as the leader of the Back to the Bible radio broadcast and was and still is a very influential uh writer and author. He says, with the coming of Jesus Christ, the nation of Israel moved out of childhood into adulthood. The long period of preparation was over. While there was a certain amount of glory to the law, there was a greater glory in the gracious salvation of God as found in Christ. The law could reveal sin and, to a certain extent, control behavior. But the law could not do for the sinner what Jesus Christ can do. To begin with, the law could never justify the guilty sinner. I will not justify the wicked, said the Lord. Exodus 23, 7. Yet Paul states that God justifies the ungodly. Romans 4, 5. King Solomon, at the dedication of the temple, reminded God to condemn the wicked and justify the righteous. 1 Kings 8.32 
And this was a proper request in light of the holiness of God. The trouble is, nobody was righteous. It is only through faith in Jesus Christ that the sinner is justified, declared righteous before God. Furthermore, the law could never give a person a oneness with God. It separated man from God. There was a fence around the tabernacle and a veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. I want to ask you to go back to the first sentence of Wearsby's comments. With the coming of Jesus Christ, the nation of Israel moved out of childhood into adulthood. There is a sense in which I believe that is happening to us. I believe that with our understanding of the message of the grace of God, we are moving out of childhood into adulthood. I hope that doesn't sound condescending in any way. I don't mean to, but I do believe that that is true. I believe that we are coming into adulthood, as it were in the sense of understanding the uh, salvation that was wrought out for us on Calvary and the implications of that salvation. Last week we said that in verse 26, Paul explains why believers in the age of the new covenant who have exercised faith in the historic Christ are no longer under the guardianship of the law. And when we speak about the historic Christ, we are talking about the Christ who has already come. We remember that the Old Testament saints looked forward to a Christ who was prophesied, a Christ who had not yet come, but we now look back at a Christ who has already come and we place our faith in him. Paul says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. In this verse, Paul changes from using the first person, we, which is a reference to the Jews in the Galatian church. And he being a Jew, included himself in that number. He moves from the first person, we, to using the second person, you, which refers to both the Jews and the Gentiles. By so doing, Paul shows that the wall of separation between the Jews and the Gentiles had been broken down at the cross. We looked at that when we were studying the book of Ephesians, and that both races, both Jews and Gentiles, have become the sons of God in Christ Jesus. We said that the Greek word translated sons is huios, which properly means a son by birth or adoption. Figuratively, the word signifies Sorry, the word refers to anyone sharing the same nature as their father. The word signifies someone who is of full age. Paul is saying here that under law, the individual was a minor and was therefore under a guardian. And the guardian was the law. Now, under grace, the individual has attained to the status of an adult son and has therefore outgrown 
the surveillance of the former guardian. You see why I am saying, in a sense, we are moving out of childhood into adulthood because we are understanding now that we are under grace and not under law. In verse 27, which is our focus this evening, Paul begins to inform his readers of his basis for claiming that believers in the age of the new covenant who have exercised faith in Jesus Christ are all the sons of God in Christ. He writes, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. In verse 26, Paul had spoken of the Galatian believers as being in Christ, referring to the mystical union which exists between Christ and the believer. Now, in verse 27, he reminds them of how they became united with Christ. In verse 26, he tells them, you are united with Christ in a mystical union. In this verse, verse 27, he explains to them, or he begins to explain to them how they became united with Christ. He explains that when they put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit baptized or placed them into Christ. And when we use the word mystical, the mystical union which exists between Christ and the believer, we use that word in the sense of having a spiritual meaning, a spiritual reality, a reality that may not be apparent to the senses or obvious even to the intelligence. We can't see it, we can't Watch it, we can't smell it, we can't hear it, but we know that it is there. We know we are in union with Christ. Brothers and sisters, when we were saved by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were positioned in him and identified with him forever, forever, in a mysterious but very real spiritual sense. We were clothed with Christ. We were placed into the body of Christ, and we were thus united with him. What does that mean? That means that his life became our life. His righteousness became our righteousness, and his inheritance became our inheritance. And we are talking about a life and a righteousness and an inheritance which are permanent, permanent. Paul refers to this as being baptized into Christ. It is very important for us to understand that contrary to what we may have been taught previously, the baptism of which Paul is speaking in this verse is not a reference to water baptism. Let me say that again. Paul is not referring to water baptism. When he says to us in verse 27, for as many of you as were bapti baptized into Christ have put on Christ, he's not talking about water baptism. That is what many of us may have been taught and thus have believed. That is not what he's talking about. I think it was Ray Pritchard who says some Christians Whenever they hear the word baptism, they smell water. 
And he explains that when he was much younger, he lived in a very dry area. And he had a horse who could smell water. No matter how dry the area they were going through, the horse would smell water and pick up his head and head towards the water. And he said, some believers are like that. Once they see the word baptism, they head for water. We have to guard against that. Paul is not alluding here to so-called baptismal generation. Baptismal regeneration is the belief that baptism is essential for salvation. Those who believe in baptismal regeneration believe that water baptism is the means by which God actualizes the forgiveness of sins for the believer. In other words, your sins are not forgiven until you are baptized in water. And some will go further and say it has to be in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But to use this verse as a proof text for the view that baptism is necessary for salvation is to ignore the context of the passage as well as the overall context of Scripture in order to try to prove an erroneous preconceived theological view. Now, I know that this might disturb several of you, both here and those who are listening, because you are convinced, like Ray Pritchard's horse, that whenever you see baptism, it must be water baptism. But um, we have to uh, try to be as honest with the scriptures as we can be. In order to determine if this passage supports baptismal regeneration or is even a reference to water baptism, we only have to read the immediate context. The overall context of Galatians is centered on Paul's concern that some of the Galatian believers were turning from the authentic gospel of grace to a false gospel of works. Galatians 1, 6 to 10 tells us this. The false gospel that the believers in Galatia were embracing was one that mixed God's grace with the works of the law including circumcision as a requirement for being saved, much like those who add baptism to faith as a requirement for salvation. Paul's message in Galatians is very, very clear. It is summarized in chapter 2 and verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one, will be justified. The, this context of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is seen throughout the first three chapters of Galatians and is reinforced in chapter 3 and verse 26, which we dealt with last week. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith, through faith. If you are 
a Christian, just touch yourself and say, I am a son of God through faith. This verse, along with all other passages of Scripture dealing with salvation, makes it clear that salvation is through faith in Christ Jesus. And since water baptism must always be preceded by faith, if it is to have any meaning at all, we can know that it is faith in Christ that saves us, not the water baptism that follows faith. While water baptism is important as a way of identifying us with Christ, it only has meaning if it comes from saving faith, which always comes first. Do you understand that, beloved? You understand that? Is there any plausible reason from the context of this verse, apart from a preconceived idea, just looking at the context of this verse, is there any plausible reason to assume that Paul is speaking here of water baptism? The obvious answer is no. There is no contextual evidence from which to draw such a conclusion. The Greek word translated baptized in Galatians 3.27 is baptizo. That's how it's pronounced. Baptizo. Which pictures the placing of a thing into a new environment or into something else. The word literally means to place into to place into, baptizo. Since the ritual of water baptism involved that action, which action? The placing into of the person in water. The Greek word meaning to place into came to signify also what we mean by the act of administering the rite of water baptism. Water baptism has three usages in the New Testament. And we are going to briefly look at them. And I want you to think about which one of these three is Paul dealing with in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Number one, there is a ceremonial baptism where the saved person is baptized in water, not in order to be saved. You notice I said where the saved person, the already saved person, is baptized in water as a testimony of his or her salvation, such as 1 Corinthians 1, 14 to 17. Paul is writing and he says, I thank God that I baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name or in Paul's authority. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. May I just say here that if the gospel were an integral part, sorry, if baptism were an integral part of the gospel, it would seem rather awkward for Paul to be saying, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. That's ceremonial baptism. Remember, we are trying to find out which one of these is Paul dealing with 
in verse 27 when he says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Number two, there is a mechanical baptism in the sense of something being introduced or placed into a new environment or into union with something else so as to alter its condition or relationship to its previous environment or condition. We have an example of this in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one spirit, capital S, which signifies the Holy Spirit, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. Obviously, that could not be water baptism. So if you smell water here, something is wrong with your nostrils. Your sense of smell is really gone wrong. This is talking about a spirit baptism. That should be very clear. Paul makes it very clear when he says, and we're all were made to drink of one spirit. Number three, there is a metaphorical or figurative use of the term. In Mark 10, 38 to 40, we have, an, of a, we have an example of such a use. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able and Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus is saying here, I have to drink a cup and I have to be baptized with a baptism. And he's talking about the baptism of suffering that he will soon have to undergo. He's saying, I am going to be immersed in suffering. I'm going to be, I'm going to be enveloped by suffering. And he said to James and John when they wanted to sit at, on his right hand and on his left hand in his glory, he says, are you willing to go through that? And they said, yes. And he says, you will indeed go through it. And just incidentally, brethren, be careful how you want to sit at Jesus' right hand or left hand, because you're going to have to deal with a baptism. You see how quickly they said, yes, we are able. And Jesus said, certainly, you are going to have that experience. It wasn't long from this before Herod took a sword and thrust it right through James. And that was the end of James. James had to deal with suffering and John, his brother, had to deal with the suffering of seeing James killed. So you want to be on Jesus' right hand and left? No problem. So which one of these three uses of baptism you think Paul was dealing with in Galatians 3.27? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Number two, you say, Simone, you are perfectly right. I will give you a prize next week. Mechanical baptism. Paul's use of the word baptizo in Galatians 3.27 is clearly mechanical. There is no mention of water anywhere in the context of Galatians chapter 3. Paul is speaking here of the introduction or placing of the believing sinner into the new environment of Jesus Christ and the church, which is his mystical body. This union radically and permanently 
alters his or her condition and relationship to his or her previous environment or condition. In this sense, baptizo means to be completely identified with. It is this baptism that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, which we read earlier. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and were all made to drink of one spirit. Brothers and sisters, listen to what Paul says. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. He's talking about the body of Christ. And he says that it is the Holy Spirit that baptizes us or places us into the body. It is not water baptism that does so. It is the Holy Spirit who places a believer into the body. This is what Paul is saying here. There's a lot that I could say about this. But we won't take the time to deal with this this evening. But it has a lot of implications for Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Because if it is water baptism that removes a person's sins, if it is water baptism that causes a person's sins to be forgiven, and yet Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit is the agent by which someone is baptized into the church. So how is it that a person can be placed into the body of Christ and their sins not be forgiven. That is theological insanity. And in the practice of where we were before we came here, most people were said to have been filled with the Holy Spirit before they were baptized. So all of those people who were filled with the Holy Spirit, were already in the body, but their sins had not been washed away because they had not yet been baptized. So the Holy Spirit had placed them into the body. He had baptized them into the body, but they, their sins were still retained to them. What madness is that? Just think about it. You only have to think about it for a little while. It is insane. I did say we wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. The question we need to answer from Scripture is, how does an individual get baptized into Christ? We just answered it through the Holy Spirit. But another way of asking the question is to ask, what makes a person a believer? doesn't get more basic than that. The answer to these questions in, is found in Romans chapter 8, 8 to 9. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. One of the things Paul is saying there, that anybody who has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them cannot be in the flesh. It is impossible for a Holy Spirit baptized believer, somebody who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit to be in the flesh. Remember that we said the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
introduces the person into a new environment and condition. The person has been moved out of the flesh into the spirit. Now it is possible for the person to behave as if he or she were still in the flesh. But positionally he or she is not in the flesh. So don't let anybody tell you as a believer that you are still in the flesh. Every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And if you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, Paul says you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. I am no longer, you are no longer dead in trespasses and sins. But sometimes if you watched our actions, you wouldn't believe that. You would think, you would think that we still are. Positionally, we are no longer in the flesh. We are in the spirit. It's time we get serious with the word of God, brethren. What is it that makes a person a believer? It is his or her being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Which baptism is it that places a person into Christ or makes him or her a part of the body of Christ? Is it water baptism? Of course not. It is spirit baptism that does so. Is it not obvious, brothers and sisters, that the baptism that 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and Galatians 3, 27 are referring to is not water baptism at all? Both verses are clearly referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit by which believers are made part of the body of Christ as they are indwelt by his Holy Spirit and are marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit according to Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. And when were we sealed with the Holy Spirit? When were we sealed with the Holy Spirit? Was it sometime after we believed? We have made reference to Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 14. I'm going to turn there and read it. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 14. You can find it on your cell phones because I know you don't have a Bible. Ephesians chapter 1, 13 to 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So the moment we placed our trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The Spirit's baptism, indwelling, and sealing occur at the time of conversion. These three things happen at the same time. The Spirit baptizes us or places us into the body by means of his indwelling. And by means of his indwelling, he seals us because Jesus Christ says the Holy Spirit is given to us and he will abide with us forever. So his abiding with us forever is what seals us. All these three things happen at the time of conversion. And that is why you will find no commands in the New Testament for believers to be baptized, indwelt, or sealed with the Spirit. What does Paul say we should allow the Holy Spirit to do? What does he say in Ephesians 5.18? Be filled with the Spirit. 
only a person who is already baptized with the Holy Spirit can be filled. Paul never says, pray that, he never says to Christians, pray that you will be baptized with the Spirit. He says, be filled with the Spirit. That is a constant command. What he means to say, if you are already indwelt by the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to control you. Give him the opportunity to regulate your life. That's what it means to be filled by the Spirit or with the Spirit. Be controlled, be dominated by the Holy Spirit. Years ago, a gentleman who was a bishop, he said to me and another brother that uh, many persons in the church, they are only filled with the Spirit, you know. But there are a few, and I am one of them. And I believe you two brothers are also like that. I am baptized with the Holy Spirit. You realize that that is madness. It would have been better for him to say it the other way around, you know. It would have been better for him to say, every Christian, every believer is baptized with the Holy Spirit, you know, but I believe that you have some, and I am one, and I believe you two men are one that are filled with the Spirit. That's what you should really have said, but that wouldn't even be true. Because he was kind of almost elevating himself to a very high rank. As if he's an elite, you know, one of the special ones who is privileged to be filled with the Spirit. As though all believers don't have that privilege. And I was a junior. Fairly senior at the time, but still a junior. So I... Just said to myself, this is nonsense, you know. But it would have looked hard for you to embarrass the man in front of this other bishop. So just don't say anything. All of this is the unbiblical use of language. That is one of the things, brethren, we must, we must start to be orthodox in our use of biblical words. Eh? That will help us to be orthodox in our doctrine. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us. I have been saying to us, ever since we started, that let me say it again, brethren. Erroneous doctrine promotes erroneous belief. An erroneous belief gives rise to erroneous behavior. You cannot fix the problems that are the result of erroneous doctrine by trying to fix systems and trying to fix administration. The problem is doctrinal. And until you deal with the false doctrine, you will not be able to see any change in the system or the administration or the behavior of people. Because you are just tinkering 
with the system and with the administration. If you have a short circuiting of electricity, it don't make no sense you change the bulb. You understand what I'm saying, brethren? If Chichi eating down your wall, it don't make no sense you paint it. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John is saying, I am baptizing you with water. But there is a Holy Spirit baptism that I am not able to administer. Only Jesus Christ can administer that. No altar worker can help you with that. It is the Holy Spirit who baptizes the believer into Jesus Christ. The act of water baptism is merely an outward picture of this inward reality accomplished by the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit baptism is the personal and private experience that identifies the believing sinner with Christ. While water baptism is a public witness of the person's identification with Jesus Christ. In other words, water baptism is an outward picture of the inner work of the Holy Spirit. It is the baptism with the Holy Spirit which baptizes us into the body. Something is wrong here. This is a typographical error. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit which baptizes us into the body of Christ, into his death, his burial, and his glorious resurrection. Please amend that for me. It is a mystery as to how every person person who is a Christian. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. How is it? Can you explain this work of the Holy Spirit placing us into the body and identifying us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? This must be a supernatural work. We are, when we are united with Jesus Christ, we are identified with everything that has to do with Jesus Christ, you know. We participate in his death, burial, and resurrection. So much so that Paul could say in, Galatia, in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. The whole of this paragraph is messed up. I'm sorry to say. So we participate. Listen, br brothers and sisters, look at me for a little. If you and I have been 
baptized with the Holy Spirit. That baptism so unites us with Christ that we participate in his life of perfect obedience. None of us here actually lived a perfect life or will ever live a perfect life. But because we are identified with Christ, God credits to us Christ's perfect obedience. Because we are united with Christ, God credits to us the death of Christ. We died with him. We were buried with him. We were resurrected with him. That's a mystery. Is, can you explain how a person living in this age can be transported back to the cross so that everything that Jesus accomplished there is also mine? It's a mystery, but it's a great spiritual reality. Galatians 3.27 is not referring to water baptism at all. Those who try to force baptismal regeneration into this verse have no scriptural grounds for doing so. Paul says those who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The words put on are a translation of the Greek word enduo, which means to clothe or be clothed with in the sense of sinking into a garment. In Luke 15, 22, the father of the prodigal son instructs his servants to bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. The words put it on are a translation of the same Greek word, and duo. Clothe him in it. Figuratively, the word conveys the idea of entering into an actual relationship with someone else. In the same way that a person who puts on a garment envelops himself or herself in the garment and is defined by it, so the person who is baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit is entirely immersed in Christ and in his salvation and is defined by Christ and his salvation. The New English translation renders the verse as follows. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. The New Living Translation furnishes this rendering, rendering. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. The baptism of the Holy Spirit so unites and identifies believers with Christ that Scripture says of them that they died with Christ. We just mentioned that. Colossians 2.20 they were buried with Christ, Colossians 2.12. They were made alive with Christ, Ephesians 2.5. They were raised with Christ, Colossians 3.1. They are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, Ephesians 2.6. They are to be manifested with Christ in glory, Colossians 3.4. All this is said of the believer at the present time because he or she is in Christ Jesus as a result of being baptized or placed in him by the Holy Spirit. Warren Wearsby comments that, and I quote, the phrase, put on Christ, Galatians 3.27, refers to a change of garments. The believer has laid aside the dirty garments of sin, and by faith receive the robes of righteousness in Christ. But to the Galatians, this idea of changing clothes would have an additional meaning. When the Roman child came of age, he took off the childhood garments and put on the toga of the adult 
It isn't. The believer in Christ is not just a child of God. He is also a son of God. The believer has an adult status before God. So why go back into the childhood of the law? End of quote. But we must realize that with privilege comes responsibility. Inwardly, we are clothed with Christ. We cannot ever get any more of Christ than we got at the moment of salvation. You notice the song didn't say, songwriter didn't say that he wanted to get more of Jesus. Because he knew that you couldn't get more of Jesus. He said, more about Jesus would I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. Don't pray for more of Jesus. It's not possible to get more of him. How much more of Jesus can you get than the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you? The big question is, is he being seen outwardly? Every believer has Christ indwelling them, but is he being seen outwardly? Our new position should motivate a new practice. Our new position should motivate a new practice. Since we have clothed ourselves with Christ, we need to wear Christ so that others see him on us and thus recognize that he is in us. We need to live like Christ, and the only way to do so is to depend on the Holy Spirit to give us both the desire and the power to live like him. The New English translation renders Philippians 2, 12 to 13 in the following way. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, Continue working out your salvation with awe and reverence for the one bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort for the sake of his good pleasure is God. It is our responsibility by the effectual operation of the Holy Spirit to work out in our everyday practice the Christ life, the Christ life that has been worked in just as the Lord Jesus did when he walked the earth by a total dependence on the Holy Spirit. Let us stand, please. If I could sing, I would sing, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wondrous compassion and purity. O oh, thou spirit divine, all my nature refine till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. That's what we want, you know, brothers and sisters. That's what the world wants. If we have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, what we need to earnestly pray for 
is to be continually filled by the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, dominated by the Spirit. Can anybody tell me how to ensure that this is a reality? How can we ensure that we are filled by the Spirit? Nobody? Oh my. By allowing the word of God to dwell in us richly. Colossians 3.18 If you read both passages, Ephesians 5.18, where Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. And Colossians 3.18, where he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. We will see that the very same things result. So what he's actually telling us is that the way to be filled by the Spirit is to have the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. Which means more than just reading. Colossians 3.16. Thank you, Kim. Colossians 3.16. It means more than just reading. It means meditating on. It means praying the word. Do you do that, brothers and sisters? When you do your daily Bible reading, do you take time to say, Lord, I'm guilty of this, you know. I have not yet committed murder because I have committed somebody's vineyard. Like Ahab. But I have coveted another man's wife or husband. All right, I think it's time to pray. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, thank you for the love that you have demonstrated for us over the last seven years, particularly since you have begun to instruct us as it relates to the doctrines of grace. Thank you for the patience that you have displayed, for the long-suffering, Lord, for the way that you have dealt with us gently. Uh, continue to deal with us in this way, Lord, as we grapple with what we now know to be intense Christianity, not the mere following of rules, but grappling with allowing the Holy Spirit to dominate and control us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for the entrance of your word, which brings light the clarity that you are bringing to us on scriptures that we may not have understood correctly. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that springs alive in our hearts every time we hear about your grace, every time we hear about the wonder of your salvation, every time we think that you elected us to this wonderful position of not just children of God, but sons of God. Lord, we thank you that we are moving into adulthood, no longer needing a guardian. There are children, Lord, that when they are able 
to move about in a more free way. We put them in a playpen. They have a little room, but they are still fenced in. But now, Lord, we are adults. And we are not fenced from the outside. We are supposed to be controlled from the inside, which is what you wanted for Adam. Help us to walk in that liberty, not a license to do what we want, not a license to sin, but the liberty to pursue your righteousness, the liberty to live the way you want us to live through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.